Welcome to the first session of the 2020 ASPPH virtual annual meeting. I'm Laura Bagaña, President and CEO of ASPPH, and I'm excited to announce that our in-person annual meeting has gone virtual to support the continuous commitment and engagement of our public health community in the local response to the coronavirus. ASPPH virtual annual meeting will be held on Fridays, starting today until May 15th as well as next Wednesday and Thursday, with webinars featuring key speakers and selected sessions. I hope you will join us over the next two months as we continue our discussions and networking virtually. I want to thank our board of directors and all of our members for their guidance and support during these unprecedented times. Today, we are launching the virtual annual meeting with a focus on the most pressing public health challenge we are facing today, COVID-19. I'm honored to introduce the chair of the ASPPH Board of Directors and the moderator of today's session, Dr. Sandro Galea. Dr. Galea is the Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health and has been appointed to lead the Massachusetts Emergency Task Force on Coronavirus and Equity. Dean Galea. Thank you, Dr. Magania. So good, uh, good morning or afternoon, everybody, wherever people are. I, um, as uh, Laura just mentioned, uh, uh, number one, this is uh, a really a shift for us from uh, what was really planned, long anticipated, and much looked forward to uh, in-person meeting, to creating a virtual meeting where we'll have a number of sessions over the next few weeks uh, that um, obviously are no substitute for in-person meeting, but hopefully give us a chance to connect around the issues that matter. We opted to create a virtual meeting that is spread out over a few weeks, recognizing that all our members are extraordinarily busy at this time because of the pandemic of uh, COVID-19. And uh, we did not want to concentrate all our sessions in any one time when we felt most members could not be able to participate. So the idea today is really to launch appropriately enough with a session on COVID-19. And uh, it really, I think, is a testament to the organization and its depth and strength to have outstanding speakers like the ones we have today. I'm not going to spend any more time talking about the disease because the presenters will. But just to note that from my perspective, this is the time, this is a time for public health. It is a time when the world is listening to the message of public health. And as a result, I think we all in our individual institutions have the potential and the possibility to really sharpen the world's thinking around public health and what we need to be saying to change the conversation to create a healthier world. And I wanted to say, from my perspective, thank you, not just to the organization, but thank you to all of you who are uh, participants as well as to the presenters for what you are doing every day for the work of public health. It is really a privilege to be part of this community. But uh, I'm not one of the presenters. I'm simply here to moderate because really I'm here to learn from the presenters as I am sure you all are. So just by format, we're going to do the following. We have four presenters. They are each going to talk for about eight minutes. And uh, once the presenters finish, we will take questions. There is a way for you to send uh, questions through the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. And uh, I will then direct questions to the, to the uh, presenters. So we have, if each presenter talks for about eight minutes, we'll, uh, we should have plenty of time for questions. So with that introduction, I'm going to move to our first presenter, who is uh, Dr. Carlos Del Rio from Emory University, who will really set the stage, talk a little bit about the epidemic and uh, where it came from, where we are now, and what we can look forward to. Dr. Del Rio. Carlos, I think can, you're on mute. Can, can everybody hear me? Now we got you, yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, now we can. Okay. So clearly, uh, this is unprecedented times, and, and I want to be sure that people understand where we are and where we are going. Uh, so the, uh, the virus is it's a, it's, a, it's a virus of the family of the coronaviruses, and coronaviruses are are part of a, a large family of viruses that can infect many uh, an, many animals, and they are uh, 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 they're named because of the spike on their surfaces. And there are many coronaviruses that infect humans. There are in fact uh, seven. Uh, four of them are the causes of the common cold, and three other coronaviruses are the beta coronaviruses. Uh, that are new ones, and, and are, are, are the SARS, the MERS, and now this COVID-19 virus. Uh, this virus uh, emerged uh, late in November of last year in the city of Wuhan in China, 
and uh, and because it has spread uh, globally, because it's now caused uh, over 100,000 cases in over 100 countries, it has now been declared a pandemic. The uh, the transmission of this virus is likely through respiratory secretions, uh, and it's, it's spread through respiratory droplets that can be in the air or can land on surfaces. And the virus probably survives in surfaces anywhere between a few minutes up to maybe nine to 12 hours, depending on the surface, surface and the temperature and other things. Uh, there's been data suggesting that you can look at viral RNA in the stool, but the virus has not been culture found alive in stool, and therefore it's not, it's not thought stool can lead to transmission. And there's no evidence of perinatal transmission. So signs and symptoms are very nonspecific. It's very hard to distinguish this from other respiratory infections. I would say there's something that makes it a little different is maybe, maybe there is less of rhinorrhea and upper respiratory symptoms here. But the great majority of people, the incubation period is about five days, maybe a range of two to 14. The great majority of people have a mild illness with fever, a dry cough, and nothing else. And, and that's about 80% of people, but about 20% of people require hospitalization. Of those that get hospitalized, about a third end up in the ICU, and some require mechanical ventilation. At this point, there are no approved medications. There's a clinical trial, several clinical trials happening right now with, for therapeutics, and there is a vaccine being developed, but we're far from having a vaccine. So really, the focus has to be on supportive care and it has to be on, on, on ensuring that we can deal with transmission and stop transmission. Uh, the mortality is, is hard to guess, but at this point in time, we all estimate that it's probably around 1%, but it increases significantly if you're older or you know, if you're immunocompromised. And if you're over the age of, uh, of 70 and if you have underlying conditions such as diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, it may be as high as 20%. The uh, testing is an issue, and we can talk more about testing later, but testing has been a major problem in our country and continues to be an area of weakness. And even though tests have been made, made available to <clears throat> public health departments, now the reality is, I'll just give you a number, uh, South Korea yesterday tested 20,000 people. The U.S. in two months has tested maybe 8,000 people. So we're way behind as a country in testing and this has impaired our response. Uh, there are a lot of unknowns. We don't know how, how, how contagious is this virus. Uh, we don't know what the optimal protective equipment to use. We don't know how the pandemic would last. We don't know effective treatments. We don't know when a vaccine will be available. But one, sure, one thing we know for sure is that recommendations will change as we learn more and the situation evolves. So I, I encourage people to stay informed, to stay prepared, and to be ready for, for what really is a very rapidly changing epidemic. And with that, I'll pass it to somebody else. Thank you, Dr. Del Rio. Um, um, that, was, uh, that was terrific. It was a really nice uh, overall summary. We're gonna move on to Dr. Donna Peterson. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Peterson is the um, uh, past chair of the board of ASPPH, preceded me. And uh, she has been, had a very active leadership role in her university around the response to coronavirus, as she's had in many other matters. And so much of what we're seeing happening nationally and locally is around leadership and around the need for the right type of leadership at the right moment that we thought it was important for us as an association, as the voice of uh, academic public health, to talk about that and to think about leadership as part of how we look at this epidemic going forward. Dr. Peterson. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate this opportunity. It's, um, it's actually nice to have a little break from everything we've been doing here at the, at, at the university. I think what Carlos just said is really the most important thing that we all have to remember. We were asked by our president, who is new, by the way, um, a few days after the first case was reported in the United States, and he asked a few of us to help him draft a communication to the university community, and we did that. And we actually said to ourselves, all right, that was good, good we did that. Um, until there's a case in our community, we probably don't need to do anything else right now. And by Monday morning, there were two cases in the, in, in the Tampa Bay community. The president called an emergency meeting at 10 a.m. And by 10.04, I was chairing his task force. 
And I think that was a good, um, it was good in that he recognized what public health brings to something like this and that the leadership that we can provide um, can really help the university in its role, taking care of all of its, um, all the members of its community on the campus, um, the community partners that we have, our students, and how we effectively communicate um, all of that. I also think from a public health perspective that we always, most of us, I believe this is true, also have a role in the community outside the university. Uh, we are often very well connected, not only to our public health uh, colleagues, but to other community organizations and groups. And they look to us for, for, for guidance in times like this. So I think we've been very conscious of not only what we need to do for the university and of course our concern for the health and safety and well-being of our students and our faculty and our staff but recognizing the nature of the virus we have to also be concerned about the larger the, the larger community so if we're debating how to help students who may need to self-isolate um, we also need to be concerned about where that occurs so that we don't inadvertently create challenges outside of of our of our institution when we start debating um, whether or not employees should be allowed to or encouraged to work from home, um, again, we have to think about uh, where do they live, who do they live with, what is, what is the potential harm if we uh, encourage them to come to campus um, instead of encouraging them to, to stay home. So I think both of those roles um, become very important and we play a very important role as leaders, both in the university and the, in, in the community. And the last thing I would say, as I'd rather, I, I, I wanna hear from my colleagues and I wanna hear from folks on the line, is this is an incredible teaching opportunity for our students. And I think um, a, lo a lot of us have used this moment to ask them what they would do. We go over reports in the media, we go over um, uh, some of the things that we're hearing from our own constituents, some of the, uh, the rumors that are going around. And I think also helping our students understand while we try to understand this is this event is unprecedented in most of our all of our lives, I believe. And it's also happening at a time when um, the media outlets and the media um, tools that people have available to post and share their concerns, share rumors that they're hearing. Um, it just creates a whole another layer of uh, a need to effectively try to manage communications. And for us, it's been a challenge to try to stay ahead of the curve, keeping up with the data, monitoring, um, uh, um, understanding how the situation is changing, trying to get effective communications out quickly to try to counter that. But then at the same time, as Carlos said, and I think it's really important, this is changing every day if not every hour and so trying to make sure your communications don't appear to be contradictory but in fact build on each other um, has been uh, I think a challenge for all of us so with that I will stop and uh, happy to hear what others have to say thank you Donna let's uh, let's now move on then from that from a bigger picture view to hearing a little bit about leadership and role of leadership to two places which have um, been dealing with the with the sort of cutting edge of this epidemic right from the beginning ahead of uh, where most of us are at in the rest of the country and the rest of the world. First, we have Dr. Chang Chuan Chen, who is the um, uh, Dean of the School of Public Health in Taiwan. Dr. Chen. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's my pleasure to share with you uh, our experience in uh, Taiwan and as Sandra has mentioned, we are in the first stage of uh, this uh, pandemic. And uh, we were, uh, uh, myself and the whole uh, college has been heavily involved within the campus and in our society. And I want to share with you some of this uh, experience we have. You know, we are, are working on day by day uh, data analysis of the the, all the data we can collect locally and internationally, try to figure out uh, what's uh, going on and what is expected. And we also uh, gave our the government uh, a science-based advice uh, of the weekly uh, statements on the current situations. So we have uh, around the one and 
one to two hours uh, uh, statements and a live broadcast on the web. And we also give the whole university the way how to uh, control the infections and we give them a lot of guidelines and the universities follow uh, our device. And you know, Taiwan's experience with SARS 2003, the first coronavirus uh, epidemic, actually shapes the way we manage the current uh, COVID-19 outbreak. You know, our society as a whole learned harsh lessons from uh, 2003 uh, SARS outbreak. So from our government side, they create new agencies, you know, uh, Center of Disease Control, and uh, which has a very, very big power during the epidemic and uh, command control a lot of resource. And locally, our health bureau, as some of you has visited, they are very uh, vigorous and very well trained. So uh, it's easier to do uh, a lot of the, this uh, case findings and tracings and uh, Etc. And also the scientific institutions uh, are also uh, uh, stronger than what we have back in 2003. So um, and this is the, the foundation. And on top of that, our hospitals and clinics, uh, the, the infectious control are much improved over the years. So all this actually a uh, very important uh, experience that shape how we uh, do this. So in a word, we have a playbook of SARS. So from beginning, uh, we are following uh, what we have done uh, during the SARS epic. And I think the most important uh, lesson we learned from SARS epidemic is, you know, you cannot expect timely and accurate disease outbreak data from China. So in the early stage of this outbreak, we decided to err on the side of caution and take serious actions based on a small number of initial reports. And I thought we wisely started screening and eventually banning visitors from Wuhan and then the rest of China. So these measures, I think, is one of the first in the world. And so this border policy is our most important and successful containment measures. And I think this is the reason why Taiwan still have relative low of import, imported courses from China compared to other countries. And, you know, uh, the other things we have for this um, uh, containment uh, strategy is, you know, we have very comprehensive contact tracings for people who, uh, cro who, uh, who closely contacts confirmed cases or patient under the investigations by so-called digital tracings. So we use a lot of mobile phone uh, to, to lo locate uh, where are the people's are. So I think those are very good way to uh, find the cases very fast then a strict policy of home isolation and quarantine of the confirmed cases. I think this greatly reduces the probability of further transmissions. And later on, you know, we came to a, a, a very uh, important uh, public health argument in Taiwan is the use of surgical masks. You know, our uh, public health professionals always thought that uh, surgical mask is not recommended for healthy people during the epidemic. But, you know, general public didn't think so. So there's a, 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 a panic buying of this. But uh, after a couple of uh, days, the government come up with a ration uh, scheme to allow people to purchase two pieces of masks from, uh, per week from uh, our pharmacies using our national health insurance card. So it's kind of integration of uh, uh, IT and with, um, by sharing a very uh, low end, but very useful uh, tools for people to become very aware 
of ongoings of this epidemic. So this is uh, something that uh, we never expected, you know. So um, that, uh, and in, until now, the, the, the public is very supportive of our government's uh, policies. And this is very important, the trust in the command centers uh, is very high. Every day we have two, uh, two press briefings to talk about the current uh, developments of um, uh, epidemic and also uh, new uh, uh, policies, new guidelines uh, are also uh, announced in this uh, uh, press conference and always together with social medias to to uh, uh, hand out of all these instructions. You know, um, what lenses we learn from Taiwan that can be uh, useful for, for, for our uh, friends? You know, we are not easy to uh, isolate from the epicenter of China. As now I, 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 I see this how uh, US dealing with uh, Europe, you know, trade and uh, public health. That should be a balance and, uh, and, and that's uh, our lessons. If you can have border control as soon as possible, when the cases are very few, you know, you can prevent uh, a, a lot of things that uh, may cause you more later. And you know, because we are single pairs, we are single payer system, so uh, it's very easy for us to mobilize all the uh, uh, health health care resource to to do the public health. So now, almost half of the medical resource uh, in medical centers, or, uh, regional hospital, and even the clinic, they. The personnel, the resources are devoted to these infection controls. And it, I think it's a little bit unique in, in, in the healthcare systems. So in a way that uh, until now, we think this uh, the 40 years, you know, the, the establishment of national health insurance uh, scheme and the communicable disease control centers and all these uh, public health infrastructures uh, saving us now to, you know, delay the epidemic, but we know the virus is in our society. So uh, this is end my uh, introductions. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. Yeah. So uh, this is my brief, briefly uh, to you. So far, we have 50 cases, you know, and over the, the, the course, and uh, we are expected uh, there will be more once we start uh, more aggressive screening. So, Sanjay, this is my first. Yeah. Is, anything else you were going to add, or is that it? No. Okay, very good. Thank you. So now we're going to move uh, back to the U.S. with uh, Dr. Hillary Godwin, who's the Dean of the University of Washington um, School of Public Health. As everybody knows, um, uh, Washington State was uh, the, uh, at the at the front end, unfortunately, of uh, this uh, pandemic in the United States, and uh, Dr. Godwin has been uh, right in the eye of that particular storm. Dr. Godwin, over to you. Thanks. Um, so I'm going to start with, since we have a broad range of public health people participating in this. Start with um, some communication strategies that I have found to be useful over the last couple of weeks. Um, and then talk about some of the strategies that we've used here at the University of Washington and in our school um, that have been particularly helpful in terms of preparedness and response. So in terms of communications, um, I guess I can't emphasize strongly enough how important it is to make sure that you are um, not only communicating um, clearly and effectively with your own internal folks, but also making sure that you're 
communications reflect um, those that are being um, promulgated by your local health department. We're super fortunate here um, to have an amazing local health department, Public Health Seattle King County, as well as a great State Department of Health. Um, and uh, so we've been very much luck and step um, with them uh, to make sure that we are reinforcing their communications. Um, some of the communications that I've found to be most helpful have been ones around why it is that we're using social distancing. Um, so there, I, what I try to communicate is that because this is a novel virus and we don't have any immunity, a vaccine, or at this point, effective treatments, um, that we really are dependent on our good old fashioned public health interventions and that those focus on social distancing um, where most people are familiar with quarantines, but because uh, this is uh, because of the circumstances and the relatively high uh, mortality rate compared to seasonal influenza that we're enacting stricter measures as well. Um, and I, I would refer all of you guys, if you haven't looked at it, to uh, hashtag flattening the curve. Um, that has uh, particularly seemed to resonate with people. Um, the idea that we're trying to uh, push down the epidem epidemic curve um, so that the number of cases at any given time does um, hopefully not exceed what our healthcare capacity is so that we are able to provide healthcare to um, those people in our community who have the um, greatest need. Um, and that social distancing allows us to do that. Um, I've also tried to be very um, cognizant about communicating to um, leadership here and to other folks um, that we need to balance uh, the risk of infection with uh, the risks and um, hardships that come along with some of those more severe social distancing um, interventions um, so that it's really important that we wait to enact um, more stringent measures until they are warranted by the local risk. Um, and that's a hard one for a lot of people. Many people um, see, for instance, that in other parts of the country that schools are closing and ask, why aren't schools closing here? Um, and the very real answer may be that there aren't enough cases locally to, or there's not enough local transmission to warrant school closures. When we have school closures, um, there are just huge social disruptions that come along with that. Um, and those social disruptions are greatest for those individuals who are most vulnerable in our society. So not only are the most vulnerable components of our society be because of uh, reasons of access to healthcare um, going to be most affected by the virus, but they are also disproportionately affected by some of these interventions that we're using um, and the economic hardships that we see associated with those interventions. So it's important to really follow the guidance from your local health departments or local health jurisdictions about when it's the right time for your community to be um, stepping forward in terms of heightening um, the types of interventions that are being used. And um, then finally, we're also really um, focusing on communicating um, the importance of supporting each other um, during these times, it can be very, once you start getting to work from home conditions, can be very socially isolating. And um, we're doing a lot of things to try and mitigate that, but also just reminding people to take care of themselves as human beings and their families and to continue to communicate with people um, that they love and cherish. So in terms of things that we have found to be most helpful, um, one is that uh, we work very closely with our local health departments and, and Washington State Department of Health. It has been extraordinarily helpful to have one person, which is in our case is our Associate Dean for Practice, Janet Basman, um, be the main contact there. Um, so she uh, has deployed students who are trained um, for helping them with their response. Um, but is also um, the one who takes information about what additional help they need and is um, surveying the community to find out who's available uh, to do volunteer work and meet those needs. Um, 
Janet also serves on our institutional um, advisory committee on communicable diseases. That means that she's directly feeding information from the local health department into decision making at the school level. And as you heard from several others, I also serve on the lead, uh, nightly leadership calls for our institution to help bring that public health perspective to our decision making as a school. Um, other really helpful things have been using online surveys um, to get out in front of people's needs for telecommuting from home. Um, and then rolling out successive ones, looking at research needs and also how we can help our local health jurisdictions. Um, and then uh, finally, the other thing that we found to be very helpful, other people have mentioned this as well, is I've been holding weekly webinars for our extended community um, within the School of Public Health to explain where we are in the process, um, help to reinforce the evidence base behind the decisions that are being made institutionally and give people a heads up of what they're like, they can likely expect um, in the days and weeks to come with the caveat that the situation is extraordinarily fluid um, and that we are all trying to be um, as nimble as we can, recognizing that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Sorry, that was my timer to not go over my eight minutes. So. Um, Let's see. Um, I guess I would just end by saying um, again, um, huge thanks to not just my team, but our local health partners um, in terms of having open communication lines and um, just the tremendous respect I have for the leadership here at the University of Washington in terms of um, really um, staying locked in step with um, what our local health department is doing. It's really helped tremendously. Okay, Sandro, back to you. Very good. Thank you, Hillary. And, uh, and uh, thank you, everybody, for your comments. So um, I'm, we're now receiving quite a few questions, which I'm seeing. Um, uh, so uh, let me, um, what I'm going to do is, I'm, I'm, I was going to ask some of my questions, but I'm going to start directly with questions from the audience. And I will uh, pick questions and ask them to the speakers. Please do send along your questions. And uh, um, uh, the, the, the shorter, more focused the questions, the better. Let me start by distilling a couple of questions from different folks. And uh, I think this one is for Dr. Del Rio. Um, uh, Carlos, the, um, the, the question is, can you tell us a little bit more about why the uh, breakdown in testing? So what, what was the genesis of this breakdown in testing? And, compound, and coupled with that, okay, given there was a breakdown, given where we are now, if you had your magic wand of all power, what should we be doing to rectify that particular fiasco now? Carlos, I think you're on mute. Uh, can you hear me now? Now we can, yes. Okay, so there's a lot of, of issues and there's a lot of questions there. Uh, I would say that, uh, that I would really encourage people to uh, to read a an article that uh, that uh, that was published in JAMA, and I just send the link right now. There's an article published in JAMA, uh, May the 9th, the diagnostic testing for coronavirus. Uh, it, this is this was a complicated issue. There were several things. You know, CDC. You have a new virus. You have to develop a test. CDC developed the test, and it's not a simple test. It's it's multiple primers. Then there was there was an issue of regulations that did not allow laboratory developed tests and you know many places wanted to develop a test but the regulations didn't let them do it and there was a series of things that happened i think right now you know the test cdc testing is going out to the health departments a lot of institutions and i want to commend university of washington for what they've done university of washington discovered they had an outbreak there because they were testing as part of their influenza surveillance and they started testing people and they realized they had a problem and I think I want to commend them because they really had a, a, did a great job there. Uh, we have still a lot of problems in our country. I can tell you that today, for example, the uh, uh, we don't have en en enough. Uh, we have the reagents for the test, but we don't have enough, for example, RNA extraction kits. There are not enough PCR machines or people trained. At University of Washington, again, the dean of the School of Medicine has Yesterday, I think, sent a message saying, postdocs, if you're working in anything else, if you're, if you're training the lab, maybe you want to be certified and start helping us so we can trust even more people. I mean, University of Washington today is testing 
1,500, doing 1,500 tests a day. My local health department is really proud that they're doing 100 tests a day. I mean, we, we have to scale up testing, and we have a problem. We didn't, we, you know, we underinvested in public health for years, so public health laboratories, like the one here in Georgia has one PCR machine. There's not enough people to run the machines. And, and I think we're paying the consequences of not having invested in public health. And I think we're all, you know, I mean, we all allow that to happen. And quite frankly, the government is responsible for that. So, so now we have to, we have to correct this. If I have my local one, I mean, I'll be honest, I would, I'm, I'm talking to anybody that has any capability of testing and say, please help us. We need to be doing, this country needs to be doing, you know, I don't know, 20 to 50,000 tests a day. And, and we're nowhere close to that. So uh, so we need everybody involved, whether it's private sector, public, uh, you know, researchers, we need everybody to be involved because testing is key in identifying cases. And I agree with Hillary, if you want to flatten the curve, you've got to start by finding people. I think identify and isolate are critical in this strategy. Thank you, Carlos. I have another question now for Dr. Cheng Chuan Chen. Um, Dr. Chen, can you uh, explain a bit uh, in more depth how active surveillance of viral screening was implemented in households? For example, how was it done and how was, how was the follow-up done for people in quarantine? You know, uh, once we identify one case, and uh, the investigators will the, the check the phone uh, or the we uh, chat uh, software like we use a lot of so-called nice in Taiwan. So you can uh, think is uh, time and place people have communications. So uh, that allowed you to trace like uh, uh, around 10 to 14 days, the close contacts of people. Then you go to uh, find them and uh, ask them. And so this is uh, our uh, uh, doctors and nurses are going together as a team to, to ask about this, uh, the, doing this TOCC, you know, there's a tracing. So, uh, uh, then they will uh, identify the, some of them are close contact and we do have these uh, uh, home isolations and quarantines uh, uh, guidelines. Then they will be uh, uh, visited by uh, twice a day, you know, by uh, uh, people who are uh, checking whether they are in compliance of this uh, uh, restrictions of movement and uh, in a very gentle way you know they always uh, and uh, some of them will uh, deliver food uh, to the people in house and uh, and uh, check whether they have uh, measured their temperatures etc so it's uh, a tremendous work that uh, uh, operated by the central government local uh, governments and uh, health bureaus play uh, a lot of uh, uh, roles in uh, doing this. And, and if the health personnel cannot do it alone, and we also have another chance of um, uh, administrations that uh, uh, we call this uh, civil, um, uh, civil department. So they uh, usually in the past and a lot of uh, social welfare uh, 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 business with the people and uh, so they know that uh, uh, people in, uh, in the district. So by this uh, network, uh, we make sure the compliance rate is high and right now it's you know, almost 99%. You know, if you say you cannot leave home and uh, I think there's a majority of them they will follow. So uh, this is how we did in Taiwan. Thank you. That's very helpful. I have a question which I think uh, will direct to um, Dr. Peterson. Donna, the question is, I'm an MPH student at an ASPPH institution, I'll actually mask the institution for the sake of this question, and I'm witnessing the case where the Ministry of Public Health, the local Ministry of Public Health, lacks transparency, is not adequately doing contact tracing or tapping into human resources. 
In such a case, how do we move forward? In other words, what can we do when the healthcare system lacks stewardship and governance? Wow, um, that's a great student and a great, <laughs> great question. I think uh, mm -hmm. we're facing, um, I think all of us have seen elements of that, regardless of where we are, depending on the country we're in or the, or the state we're in. Um, you know, it's always incumbent on public health uh, to exercise leadership and be a voice to access reliable information and make that available, to advocate with our, uh, with our, our uh, officials, to um, ask, I would say demand, but, you know, ask uh, what we might do to help them and ask them um, to be more open and transparent. I, I think people make decisions, um, uh, obviously, in the context of the culture of the, of the community, uh, in the political environment that these agencies exist within. And uh, I think it is incumbent on us to ask for uh, openness and to help uh, illuminate where we can. So getting access to data uh, from other countries, from the World Health Organization, um, comparing that to what you're witnessing in, in uh, the local community, uh, and just talking uh, openly and honestly about what's happening uh, in this situation and in the world, offering uh, solutions, and just being good, strong advocates. It's, it's difficult to take on a whole system, and I think we're all learning right now, as has already been mentioned, that our systems are, per, per, particularly in this country, not adequately resourced. Uh, we've lost a lot of the, the infrastructure support that would have made this perhaps easier to handle. But, I think it's a great question and I love to hear passion coming from our students. And I also would encourage you while you're a student, learn every skill that you can and understand how systems work and how, where are the leverage points where you can go in and try to help affect that system change. But right now, I think the best you can do is try to, to uh, illuminate, shed light, share all the data and information that you can and uh, engage people in, in open conversation about what's happening and the best uh, practices that they should be engaging in to protect themselves and their communities. Thank you. I'm going to direct a question now, Dr. Godwin. I'm actually going to read this uh, verbatim. Uh, the question is, what role can SPHs play to support education and give advice on COVID-19 to local businesses, such as restaurants, food service providers, first responders, homeless shelters, school districts, etc.? And the question adds, I think, correctly, I recognize that any such support should be working hand in hand with local health departments. Sorry, needed to unmute there. Um, yeah, back. so that, <laughs> that's a great point. So um, I guess that what I would say is um, one thing that we have been trying very hard to do is to recognize that we have a lot of different people who have expertise that is relevant to helping different parts of our community and people in different leadership positions respond most effectively to this. Um, so the most obvious ones might be uh, grabbing someone who has an infectious disease background and asking them to explain uh, on a local news station about um, how, you know, how COVID-19 works, why this is an unusual um, disease, why are we taking such strict measures. But there's also really important roles for the people who are in your schools of public health who are focused on risk communication, who um, in your environmental health and occupational health, who are working um, in terms of worker protections, in terms of working closely in terms of food service and food inspections and have those kinds of connectivities, um, making sure that they are also um, being lifted up and help to get messages out that are with the community. Um, uh, I would say same thing for making sure that our folks who are working on social determinants of health, that they are um, being vocal. Um, so really the most important thing that we have found so far is that, um, and this is something that um, most schools of public health have, is leveraging our existing networks and connectivity um, with local health departments, with local government, um, with different decision makers. So figuring out who are the people in your institution who are already working with those organizations and then providing them with the information that they need in order to um, provide good, clear communication to those groups. Very good. That helps. Let me ask the next question, and maybe I'll ask Hillary, you as well, to address it, but also Dr. Peterson. So next question is, uh, 
Can you comment about how you have been dealing with uh, sustaining community-based research during this phase of the outbreak? Hillary, why don't you go first, then we'll go to Donna. Sure. Um, so, yeah, I saw that question come up, and um, so there's two parts to it. One is that we have really taken a step back and said um, our number one priority right now is providing support for um, the people in our local health departments who are dealing with outbreak response and preparedness over in a myriad of different ways. Um, and so um, really being their backup resource um, in terms of public health um, uh, workforce has been our top priority as opposed to um, what are the research questions that, that we can handle. That being said, um, Janet Baseman, it, who's our Associate Dean for Practice and Super Connected, is also working with both the local health departments. Um, we have Nicole Errett, who does a lot of work with emergency response people, making sure that we're coordinating and identifying opportunities um, to be able to answer some really critical questions that will help us both respond most effectively to this outbreak, but also be more prepared in the future. Um, but I would say, again, most important things are having that connectivity, leveraging connectivity, um, and then realizing we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so um, really being a proactive part of um, solving the immediate problems of society is, is right now our top priority. Thank you, Dr. Peterson. Yeah, so we, and again, this is one of those things that's been evolving day, day by day. Um, and uh, I don't even know what day it is, but two days ago, I believe um, uh, all travel was banned in the state for state employees. We're a state institution. Um, and we'd already been dealing with people who are out in the community doing community-based research, which includes everything from going to schools, going to individuals' homes, going to meet with community organizations, driving all over the state. And we had already started pulling some of those folks back and said, all right, anything you can do in, uh, in an online environment, uh, please do it that way if you can. Um, anything that was a large event, we, we canceled or postponed, I should say. And then we have a few cases where people are coming in and uh, basically asking for a, <laughs> an exemption saying, you know, it's really critical that we get out and gather the data. Um, um, and then we assess those by the each. Is this critical because someone's life is in danger? Is this critical because you're trying to meet a, a deliverable date for a, an agency that funds you? You know, what's, what's the nature and, and any place we can negotiate um, a, a different approach is what is what what we're doing. We've been telling everyone, um, all right, right now we're looking at a month window where all of this has been banned. I would bet that that's going to be extended. So it just means we have to get creative and we don't want our community-based research efforts to stop. They're important, but finding other ways to gather the data, to interact with people, we're using all the tools that, that we have. And as I said, uh, by the each, I mean, one thing that is of particular concern is we run the largest program in the country to sign up people for health insurance under the Affordable Care Act. And we can do a lot of that online, we do now, but there are populations for language reasons, for out of fear or out of, they just don't have that capability. And that's one I'm actually dealing with, um, with the president of the university right now to say, you know, how do we help these people get out in the field or work with their counterparts in the field? Because this is not a time when we want to uh, to diminish people's access to people who can help them sign up for health care. This, this is a moment in time where we would want as many people accessing health insurance as possible with everything going on. So it's a great question. And I think you just have to figure out uh, other ways to do to do your work as best as best you can. Because again, as everyone has said, we're trying to minimize the risk of the of the of the transmission. Thank you. Let me address the question, Dr. Del Rio. Uh, Carlos, um, the question is: uh, Can you um, educate us about the leading hypotheses as to why this virus is not affecting children, in, in contrast with other such uh, respiratory illnesses? Well, there's a lot of hypotheses, all the way from the children being uh, somewhat protected by by having more exposures to common cold viruses 
and coronavirus and having some level of protection, to actually the opposite, saying that older people who were exposed to SARS in China and other places, uh, at least that was a theory coming from China, that they have antibodies that actually are, are developing something called antibody dependence and dependent enhancement, similar to dengue, in which you have antibodies that actually make your new infection being worse. The reality is we don't know, and a lot of the data that is coming out suggests that children are getting infected. They're simply not getting us sick. And the challenge there, therefore, is what do we do with children? Because, you know, they may get a little sick, have a little bit of, you know, cough and no big deal of the symptoms, but then they're transmitting to others. So we have a lot of questions to answer there. I don't think it's very clear yet how much do they come in, how much children get infected, how, what a role they play in transmission. And, and that's really critical. And I think until we know the answer to that, we're not going to be able to really make recommendations. And, for example, as Hillary said, do you close schools, yes or no? Well, it all depends. If children are really a major vehicle of, of transmission, you should. But if children are not a vehicle of transmission, the risk-benefit rate ratio it goes against closing schools. So, uh, And we don't have the data to make that decision. So I think right now people are making decisions based on whatever, quite frankly, is becoming a political decision rather than a scientific decision. And, you know, we frequently practice – we talk about wanting to practice evidence-based public health, but the reality is during a, an epidemic, during a crisis, uh, frequently politicians are taking decisions, and the decisions they're taking are not evidence-based, are frequently policy or politically based. And, you know, for example, the, uh, the recent travel ban implemented uh, by President Trump to travel to Europe, is that good or bad? Is that an evidence-based intervention, or is that a policy, policy-based intervention? I mean, I think our students, I'm certainly getting dizzy with these decisions. I'm sure for our students it's even harder because because we are new and not, not, you can't do during a crisis evidence-based public health. I tell people that, you know, during a crisis like this, we are, we're building the ship as we are sailing it. And, and therefore, you know, you wish you have the information today that you're going to have tomorrow. And that's really hard. Thank you. Um, let me address the question, Dr. Chen Chuan Chen. Dr. Chen, there's a question here about, uh, uh, you know, COVID-19 is being referred to as a black swan event. So. I suppose there are two questions. Number one, do you agree it's a black swan event, namely an, an unusual rare event, an unusual confluence of circumstances? And number two, how would we think about our curriculum to orient it to prepare our graduates for future black swans, if that's the case? Yeah, I, I don't think it's a real case. You know, SARS uh, 17 years ago and, uh, and now this is in these centuries so we have this SARS MERS and this COVID-19. So uh, it seems um, uh, come more frequently. So uh, uh, we just had this um, college meeting today to talk about that. Uh, we have to create a new normal. So uh, we are still uh, in this pandemic and this pandemic is changing the world and definitely changing the way we uh, teach public health. And, um, and the term of public health now becomes so uh, well perceived in our society because WHO announces, right? It's a public health emergence of international concerns and uh, also US announces this is a public health emergency. So uh, we have to uh, respond to our society needs. So we thought, uh, uh, this would be a very important thing for our uh, organization to, to start looking at all the competence and uh, all the curriculums and that we have to stress more on teaching uh, students and, uh, about it. And also our alumni has come back to, 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 to request uh, more and more information uh, from us. Either they are in uh, health bureaus or in the workplace, and uh, and they need the guidelines to to do this. So I, I think that uh, uh, we we have to rethink our curriculum, and we are going to do that. So uh, if it's possible in the future, I would like to initiate in our organization to 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 recheck that uh, the current uh, curriculums. Mm. Let me, um, let me ask a question to the whole, uh, to anybody on the panel who's interested. Um, um, there's a couple of questions. The theme is as follows, which I love this theme. 
to what extent is this event, um, um, frightening and devastating as it is right now, an opportunity to create a better health system in the U.S. and to focus us on creating the conditions that make people healthy and more resilient to this kind of event in the future? Anybody? Well, somebody has to jump in. Well, it is an election year, and that means we have lots of opportunity to debate every aspect of this, uh, of this event, and I'm sure we will. And I think uh, the question and the way you framed it, Sandro, is, is an excellent one, and it gets back to the earlier question. It, it, this is our moment, I think, to have a voice and to bring a rational uh, argument to the table about our, uh, our capacity to address issues like this, um, how we have not created those conditions. We don't provide uh, equal access to services. We don't provide equal access to health. We, uh, people, I mean, even just here, the discussions about should people work from home when you have people who have no capacity to work at home because they don't have Wi-Fi, they don't have high-speed internet, they don't have a computer. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's glaringly evident that the inequities in our society become glaringly clear when you have an experience like this. So I think we do have an opportunity. I think we have to um, be thoughtful and, and uh, loud about this, but there is an opportunity here, absolutely, because as we see how things aren't taking place the way they should and people are talking about, you know, breakdown of society, well, a lot of it was already broken and all this has done is made that very, very clear. So um, I don't know. We'll see. We have, a, we have to get through the current moment and a lot depends on if we can flatten that curve or not. Um, but we should never waste a crisis, right? This is a great opportunity to talk about what really should be happening in the United States and frankly in other countries around the world and our obligation to each other needs to be discussed as well. We cannot live in isolation. Germs don't respect political borders or political statements. That's a great answer, This is Carlos. Uh, I think Donna is absolutely right. I would say a couple of things. Uh, I love, you know, uh, Bill Fagy one, one time said to me, you, you, you know, he, he, he quotes Dolly Parton and says that, you know, Dolly Parton used to say, uh, you have no idea how how expensive it is to look this cheap. By not investing in public health, by being cheap in public health, by under investing for years, now we're gonna to have to pay billions and billions of dollars. And I think we need to remind people that this, all this under investment in public health, I mean, you know, I, I, I have CDC here, I love CDC, I think it's a great institution, but you know, they have strangled CDC, they can't hire people, they're, you know, hiring freezes, and, and quite frankly, the institution is, 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 is broken, and it's broken because we, we have strangled it and we have broken it up. And now we're, we're pretending that it's going to respond in ways that it used to respond in the past and simply not capable. So we need to be very clear that underinvestment in public health is costing us a fortune. It's going to cost us a lot. And, and if we don't say that and if we remain quiet, we are complacent. And being complacency is bad. And I can tell you from... Uh, from my years of HIV, you know, the HIV activists used to say silence equal, equals death. Well, silence equals death. If we remain quiet, people are going to die. Well, I, um, I think this is a terrific answer, um, uh, Carlos. Thank you. Um, Hillary, let me ask you one last question very briefly for you. Um, it's very, a very pragmatic question, and then I'm going to wrap up. Um, can you um, tell us what happened in um, Washington or Seattle? Um, um, with individuals who are undocumented in terms of when they were having symptoms, how did they intersect with the system? Wow, that is a great question. Um, so, yeah, so I, I think you're highlighting, Sandra, something that you've shown leadership on um, um, consistently and, and most recently through this outbreak, which is making sure that we are uh, protecting the most vulnerable in our society you haven't given a shout out to it, but I will mention your great article in Scientific American. Um, it yeah, it's really, yeah. I mean, as important as this is, as an <laughs> opportunity to make sure that we are um, emphasizing how cost effective um, prevention measures are and investing in public health, it's also a really, really important opportunity, as Donna said, to make sure that we are emphasizing that 
our social inequities in this country in terms of access to care are also big, big drivers of the health issues that we're see seeing and are going to continue to uh, be problematic during this outbreak. Um, and again, both from the health perspective and from the economic impact perspective. In terms of specifically, uh, my understanding is, Sandro, that um, our county hospitals are, are treating people um, without regard to um, documentation status or ability to pay. Um, that sh I would hope that that would be true. Um, most places we have an amazing county hospital. Uh, my husband's in it right now. So <laughs> I'm not working either as a patient. So um, uh, yeah, we just, we need to invest in that infrastructure that, that helps uh, support the most vulnerable in our society. Thank you, Hillary. I'm, I'm going to wind, uh, wrap up and uh, if I may just take the, to the moderator's prerogative for a second to echo these last few comments. This is, um, I mean, this puts public health in the spotlight like never before. And I do think it is our responsibility, particularly as academic public health, to as relentlessly, as clearly as possible to make the case, to make the case for public health and to make it clear that in many respects, a lot of the challenges we're facing now is because of underinvestment in public health. A, from an infrastructure point of view, and B, in allowing a world to, to be created that has health has and health have nots, which then, when something like this happens, is highlighted and magnified. So I think this is what we all do in academic public health. I think this is what the association helps bind us together to do. And uh, I am, uh, I've never been prouder of academic public health to be a part of it than right now. And I want to thank all the panelists, Dr. Godwin, Dr. Chan, Dr. Peterson, Dr. Del Rio, for everything that you're doing, but also for all the participants. I've been seeing the names flying by about the questions. I'm sorry I didn't get to all of them. And uh, to say to everybody, thank you. Thank you for what you're you know, doing. I mean, this, uh, this, is, this is Carlos. If I can just say, you know, I, you have a lot of participants. Many of us are in Twitter. There's a lot of information being shared in Twitter. Twitter. This is the first epidemic of social media. There's a lot of misinformation. We have an obligation to, to use social media to give the right information. And there's a lot of trusted voices in, in social media out there that we can, we, we, I encourage our students to connect with and to follow the information because it is one of the best ways to get informed. And again, this is the first pandemic ever in which social media is playing a big role. Well, with, with that charge and with gratitude to everybody for everything everybody's doing, um, uh, thank you to our panelists for joining us. Thank you to our, uh, our uh, audience for being a part of it. And thank you to ASTPH for um, um, uh, arranging this. And uh, there are upcoming events in the virtual annual meeting that are coming um, uh, right here next week. And uh, please do join us for those. Uh, and uh, please stay well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, thank you. Sandro. Thanks, Sandro. And thanks, ASPPH. Bye, Lara, thanks, ASPPH. Okay, bye-bye.